So we're thinking, if Jesus Christ is God, why is he praying to God? So we're gonna think that are there two separate beings, as Sister Elia mentioned a while ago. But no, just to, before we delve into the um, verses itself, we need to know that Jesus Christ is praying to God because Jesus Christ is 100% man. He experienced hunger, thirst, temptation, pain and suffering. But, actually no, there's no but. And he is 100% God as well, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11. So as 100% man, we must know that he is sinless without blemish or spot. And that even though he is also 100% God, he is still demonstrating the importance of praying as a human. In other words, he is setting an example to his followers. Nothing more, nothing less. So there are no two separate beings. Jesus Christ is still God. So in the first verse, uh, allow me to open John 17. In the first verse, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that the son that thy son also may glorify thee. So the hour he's talking about is pertaining to his crucifixion, which is his purpose according to, if we read uh, John 12 John 12 27. So that's his purpose. And then it says, Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So it also in John 13, 13 31 to 32. So for the glorified lesson that the Son also may glorify thee. If we read John 13, 31 to 32, let me to just search it up real quick. If that's okay, Paul. 31 to 32. So it says in John 31 to John 13 to 31 to 32. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. In verse 32, if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. So, after Judas went to carry out the betrayal of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. So the time of his glorification has come because of the soon-to-be-fulfilled death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this event, it will bring honor and praise, glory to Jesus Christ. Then it talks about how through this event, God is also glorified. In verse 32, it states that if God is glorified in him, then God will also glorify in himself and straight away glorify him because it will happen very soon or promptly without any delay. Now with John 13, 31 to 32 in mind, let us recall Isaiah 42 verse 8. God will not give or share his glory to another person. So if we think about it, wait, in John, th John 13 to 31 to 32 and ver chapter 17 verse 1, it talks about glory being shared or given to both the Father and Jesus Christ. But no. We may think that the Bible is contradicting itself, but no. The reason why Jesus Christ is being is being given glory, why he's worthy to be praised, is because Jesus Christ is God. And now in verse 32, as thou hast given me power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So, according to this verse, Jesus Christ is given power over all flesh, and He gives eternal life. And actually, we can see Him exercising this power through forgiving sins in Mark chapter ch chapter Mark chapter two, verse five to eleven. So, in Mark chapter two, verses five to eleven, it talks about how Jesus saw the sick of the palsy. Then He said, "Son, thy sons be forgiven thee." And actually, in that moment, there were scribes who were sitting there and thinking in their hearts about why, according to them, Jesus is speaking blasphemies, and that God alone can forgive sins, according to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. And if you read it, it says, I, even I, it emphasizes that He alone is the only one who can forgive sins. And if Jesus Christ has this power, and taking into account that Isaiah 43, 25 strictly says that Jesus... Uh, God alone can forgive sins. God alone can only God is the only one who can truly forgive sins. We can conclude that Jesus Christ is God. So we started off we started off pretty well, okay? For verse third for verse verse 3. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit sick so uh, I'm 
my words are not very clear. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So if you read this without any context, Jesus Christ is talking about the only true God and, and Jesus Christ who has been sent by God. So if you think about it, are there two separate beings, true God and Jesus Christ? So from this you may think that ah, Jesus Christ is just a prophet or a literal son sent by God. But no, that's wrong. Because if you read 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. This means that the one who came down from heaven is not a prophet or little son. It's, it's God Himself who became flesh to die for our sins. Okay. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given us to do. So this refers to the glorifying of God during the crucifixion. Now here we are. Verse 5. So, I myself, Paul, when I was reading this, I was getting a bit confused. So, it's, you already mentioned but that this is one of the most painful verses of this chapter. So, if we read this without any basic fundamental knowledge, like learning, ca learning calculus or solving calculus without knowing how to do arithmetic. So, if we do this without any basic fundamental knowledge or any supporting verses, our faith will just be shattered from just one Bible verse. So, if we read it, And now, O Father, Glorify thou with me thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So why does this verse appear to say that Jesus Christ was there before the world was created? So there are two gods? Or is Jesus Christ a literal son that's with the Father in heaven and came down from the heaven as a son and so on and so forth? No. Brothers and sisters, kapatid, um, do not be afraid, Paul, because First, let's defend our faith through also applying the things that we have learned from our past lessons. So if we remember Proverbs chapter 8, we already tackled that verse and we already concluded that Jesus Christ is still the one true living God. So in Proverbs 8, wisdom is what is being talked about, not Jesus Christ. And it also notes that wisdom has been there even before the foundation of the world. It has always been a part of God's nature because it's innate. So driven by this wisdom, there was the word. Now taking wisdom into account, let us remember that God knows everything. And since God knows everything, before the creation of the world, He already knew that Adam and Eve would sin. He already knew that the fall would happen. He already knew. He already planned that He Himself will manifest in the flesh and die for our sins. So what's my proof for that? Let's open our Bible in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. So if I read this in the King, in the King James Version, Paul, in verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus Christ is sinless. He does not have any blemish or spot. Verse 20, Who verily, verily, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Verse 21, Who by him do believe in God that raised up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Amen. So the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it was already foreordained. Or in simpler words, it was already planned before the foundation of the world. And then, this plan was manifested and fulfilled. So what verse 5 talks about is not in a literal sense that Jesus Christ and God were together before the foundation of the world, especially considering in our heart that it was God alone who created the heavens and earth according to Isaiah 44 verse 24, right? So rather, this verse talks about how God manifesting in the flesh was already planned before the foundation of the world. So is everyone following Paul? Clear that verse 5 is talking about the plan of God to manifest in the flesh to die for our sins.